for what we were talking about, we were actually going through the Bible looking at archaeological evidence. Wow. Well, remember way back then in the good old days? So, okay, we talked about things with the creation, different ideas about how to look at it as a science book, how to look at it as the Jews originally looked at it. We looked at a lot of different things there. We looked at the um, the period between, you know, the, the, the prehistory stuff with, like, the Tower of Babel and all that. We looked at uh, the patriarchs, the fathers of Israel. And uh, so now we are uh, going to be looking at the Exodus. Now... Uh, we did watch quite a few different videos, excuse me, um, by a professor or a doctor, I guess you could say, uh, Dr. James Hoffmeyer, an archaeologist, uh, who was talking about it, and he talked about some very interesting stuff. I'm only going to bring up the stuff that, that's important, like the highlights, I guess you could say. But um, So this is going to be a shorter lesson, but then we're going we're to have to kind of break down some stuff um, at a later period. Okay, so j just in a, in a way of recap to the dating here, there were 430 years from when Abraham was given the mo given the promise in Genesis chapter 12, where God says, "Hey, go to the land that I will show you, and uh, I will uh, I will bless the nations through you and all that." Genesis chapter 12, where he says that to when Moses is getting the law from Mount Sinai is 430 years. That, that number is one of the definite numbers of the Bible. It's very, very clear. It's repeated a hundred, hundred times. Thirty years after Moses, I'm sorry, thirty years after Abraham got the promise, he had a son named Isaac who was ridiculed or afflicted in a way um, by his brother who was an Egyptian. If you remember, Hagar was an Egyptian and Abraham had Ishmael uh, through Hagar. So he was, a, and that's when the 400 years of Affliction began. Now, the 430 years were were pretty much. All, he says that God said that there would be um, that they wouldn't have a home. Well, that began with Abraham, where he was wandering around Canaan, where technically it was going to be his, but he didn't really get to see that. Then his descendants were wandering around the area. Then they went to Egypt and they were wandering there. So it was actually 400 years of affliction, specifically from Egypt, but it wasn't. Um, straight affliction the whole time. Does that make sense? It wasn't continuous oppression the whole time. And not every single generation had the same amount of persecution. So like, for instance, there were some, there was one generation specifically who had their children being killed <laughs> and not all the, not all the, um, the generations had that problem. So you, you've got like, you know, different generations facing, and that's one of the biggest things is people take the Bible and they think that it has to be overly literal. And so when God said that there'd be 400 years of affliction, that doesn't mean of straight affliction. That just means the period of the affliction would be 400 years. Now, that obviously included Isaac being made fun of by the Egyptian, which seemed light in comparison of having your child killed. <laughs> you know. So anyways, uh, Abraham was born in 1984, Isaac born in 1884, uh, Jacob born in 1824, Joseph born in 1733. Now, if you remember, one of the last things we talked about with the patriarchs was how one of the one of the biggest I guess you call it litmus tests as to how we know that this dating is correct, is because it actually fits. That's one of the biggest things when you're when you're looking at theories with history is there's a lot of theories that just they can be easily disproven. Now you have to be careful though because just because there's not proof of something doesn't mean it's not true. In history you can't think in, in terms of absolutes. You have to think in terms of probabilities. Like, oh, that probably happened, or maybe it happened, that kind of stuff. You can't say with absolutes with history. But this is, but when we look at these dates, these are things that, that actually fit the historical detail. That remember, Moses wouldn't have necessarily had, had um, th these details later on. Like, for instance, when Abraham fights against the, um, the kings in Canaan, um, that could have only happened in a small window. That Moses would have had no way of knowing when that window was. And yet... The Bible records a historically accurate event in the only time period that it could have happened while telling it was, it was 430 years. That's just too much coincidence to to just disregard. So, okay, Moses being born in 1559. We'll look at that next week, and we'll start looking at the more specifics of, uh, of dating, all that stuff. So let's look at a few considerations. The first consideration is if you remember the, the documentaries we watched, Patterns of Evidence. You guys remember that?
There was an Exodus one, then there was one about the Moses controversy. Um, we watched those, each of those in two, di they were documentaries, we watched them in two, two, uh, two different Tuesday nights for each of them, so four in total. And one of the big things that they talk about in that documentary is David Roll's new chronology, uh, chronology, sorry, David Roll's new chronology, where uh, uh, there's the, you know, how he says it should be 400 years earlier, so we should move all this history later and all that stuff. You remember that? Or not really? He had the he had the bars, the different colored bars on the on the wall, and he moved them backwards. You remember that? So there's a few problems with that. It, it sounds like a really easy, good solution, and I mean, there's obviously the chance that he could be right, but it's not quite that e that easy. The first problem is that his view is not widely accepted. Now that's going to be a big problem, because when you're dealing with scholarship, there's thing there's things called peer review. That means that when you write something that other peers, other people who know your your field, they're going to review it and they're going to make sure that you're not just coming coming up with stuff that wonky. Well, so basically, he's come up with this whole new timeline. He came up with this in the 90s, and since then he ha he has failed to have a, a a real big following. The obvious question that we should each be asking is. Why are scholars so hesitant to, to acknowledge the possibility of this new timeline? That should concern us, because if it was something that resolved all issues, scholars would embrace it. It would take them time, but surely in 25 years we would have come a little bit further than an, a documentary. I mean, now that's not really that big of a proof. There's, there's been plenty of theories that have been put out that were not grasped on until years and years after. So. That in and of itself is an insurmountable uh, hurdle. The next problem is that his theory could be. Not that there's absolute he, – he doesn't offer anything that says, yes, this is the final nail in the coffin. This is definitely proof. He just offers a, hey, this could be the timeline, and I'm going to take all these pharaohs, and even though we've all accepted that this is the way that they reigned, I'm going to take them, and I'm just going to move them around, and that fits my timeline. Okay, well – is there a reason for that? And are you sure that you're not jumping the gun? And that's kind of what it seems like is that he's got like, oh, I can fix all the the all our timeline hist uh, problems. And it's like, well, no, that's not – no, there's a whole big thing that he's just overlooking. Uh, another thing is um, – so so absolutely it, it could be and it is interesting, but saying some of those things interesting and that could be is not the same as saying what is. Now, for instance, with this whole coronavirus thing, there's been a lot of people who have put out some really – good theories out there really interesting and compelling theories but a theory without some form of evidence is just that it's just a theory so I mean there is obviously that um, okay so it's really not convincing as a theory the next the next problem with David Roll's chronology is that it's unnecessary see he says oh there's a supposed problem let me let me fix this problem by changing everything around and even pharaohs who you thought were hundreds of years later, we're going to move that. Uh, we're going to put this guy in over here. This is over there. Miss, messing with everything. And all that history is tied together. Once you move one piece, it moves the whole puzzle. Well, you're talking about Canaanite history, Turkey history, Middle Eastern history, Israelite history. Egypt. It's all tied together. You can't just move things around willy-nilly. I mean you can't do that. But not only that, but you, you can't have no regard for ancient historians like Herodotus and stuff. You, you have to have at least a, a brief idea of, hmm, let's think about this. Um, and so he, he goes to all these different things. When our, The timeline that we have, yes, there are mysteries. Yes, there are parts that are a little bit unclear. Yes, there are parts that we might be a little bit off on, but here's the thing. With ancient history, you're not going to have all the answers, especially not all at once. It's going to take time, and just saying that there's one part that we don't understand is not the same as saying the whole system is broken. Like, there's been a lot of groundbreaking work. Um, uh, I want to say it was Edwin or Edward, Edward Th Thiel, maybe it was Edwin, but I think it was Edward Thiel, who, uh, you know, before him, everybody said, the dates in the books of Kings and Chronicles are just so far off, they can never be reconciled. These books are not historical. They're nonsense. The dates are just – you cannot reconcile them. And then along comes Edward Thiel, 
And he writes this book and says, you guys are just looking at it wrong. It looks like a problem because you don't understand. And we'll get to that when we get to the books of Kings. But so he fixed this whole problem in a book that's that thick. It's not that thick of a book, but he solved the whole problem. There's only one part that he wasn't able to resolve, and I think I've resolved it fairly well. Well, I'll talk to you about it when we get there. Um, moral of the story being, it was something where, yeah, it would have been easy and convenient to say the whole system's broken, let's rewrite everything. But he didn't do that. He said, no, let's actually look at this and, and think about it, and that's what he did, and he gave us a great work. Now, what David Rolfe said is, here's this problem, so rather than looking for a solution, I'm just going to change everything. Like well, you could do that, but it's not necessary. So in the last pro last thing with David Rolfe's system that was exemplified on patterns of evidence is that it create new it creates new problems while, while solving old ones. So he hasn't actually moved us forward; he's moved us sideways. If you're going to create a new timeline and say this is the one that all the world's scholars need to follow, then you need to solve all the problems, and he he doesn't. So there's that. So as far as my take on patterns of evidence, interesting, very interesting. There's some great stuff covered, but the conclusion was just, I think, completely erroneous. So moving on. Um, we are pretty confident about the dating of King Solomon when his reign was. Now this helps us because it gives us an, it gives us an anchor in history that we can go backwards and forwards from. And, excuse me. In St. Kings chapter 6, verse 1, it tells us that Solomon was building this temple 480 years from when the people of Israel had their exodus. Now, the problem is this. Where do we get those 480 years from? We can't, we can't verify that number. Now, I'll explain why that's important in just a second. If you add up the, the dates of Judges, it doesn't add up to 480. If you add up the dates of you know, uh, uh, the books of the law, so Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, if you add all that together, it it doesn't get to 480 when you get to Solomon. It, the, the dates are wrong. So that leaves us with an obvious problem of, okay, so how do we get to 480 so we can know that? It's nowhere recorded. Judges never tells us how long that was. Joshua never tells us how long of a period that was. In the book of Acts, when I think it's Stephen who's talking about it, says uh, Joshua did his thing for uh, about 20 years. He doesn't say exactly how long. He just says about 20, which tells us that he's not actually giving us a definite number. So we have no way of knowing how to get to this 480 years. That brings up the very interesting question. Was the 480 years just a, a um, what's it called? A guesswork, like it was about 480 years. Assuming. What? Assuming. Assuming. What? Right, right. What, was the author just saying eh, 480 years, or was he saying this definitely, literally was 480 years? There's the other people who say it was a metaphorical number. I don't see any evidence of assuming this <laughs> metaphorical, but maybe it was rounded. Maybe there's, maybe they're not trying to be exact and precise. Maybe they're just trying to give us a ballpark figure. Now, without knowing why the author of Kings wrote that number and how he got that number, there's no way that we know for sure. Now, if you know anything about Kings and Chronicles, you know that um, they used a lot of resources. If you read in Chronicles, for instance, when he says, oh, this was from the prophet Edo, this was from the Chronicles of this, this was from the – like he has so many different resources that he uses. So we're, we're left with that. So with that, we, we really can't know for sure. So if we go 480 literal years, that takes us to 1445. Now, as James Hoffmeyer pointed out in the lecture that we watched, there's no proof for an exodus happening in 1445. There's the problem. So then people like Kenneth Kitchen have come by and said, okay, here's my date. Because the city of Ramesses is mentioned, that means the exodus was actually in the 1200s. And I respect Kenneth Kitchener as a as a as a historian, as an Egyptologist, but I think that he's wrong here. There's no evidence for a Exodus in 1200s any more than, any any more than there is one in 1445. So we have these two dates that people are arguing about that neither of these dates have any evidence to back them up. We're dealing with guesswork about what could hypothetically be. That should be a problem for us because we're left with a big problem. Is the Exodus event historical or is it not? 
Now, if it is not, we have a serious problem because, once again, that means the Bible is not reliable. That means that Moses lied about something. That means how was Moses able to convince all of Israel that God was speaking when they saw it all? They saw the miracles. They, they heard the thunder from Mount Sinai. How could he have convinced them without it being actually God? So if you simply deny the Exodus event, yeah, that's easy. A lot like David Roll's system of, 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 of redoing time. But why just simply disregard it when maybe we aren't looking good enough? So, if we say, okay, 480 years as literal years, and then say somewhere within 50 years, either positive or negative from 45, so 1495 um, or 14, uh, or, or 1395, somewhere in that range right there, okay? Well, see, now, now we do have, now we do have proof, 1479. So if you do the math, that's only a 30 years off. So when you say, okay, now hold on. There's proof of an exodus, but, if, but it's at the wrong time. How do we know that this proof is the proof? It's within 30 years of when the Bible says it is. That's something we need to consider, and it's the only date in the whole history of Egypt that gives us a date. I mean, that, that gives us evidence of this event happening. Anywhere else in the Egyptian history... It could not have fit. There's no evidence of it. This is the only place in Egyptian history where we have proof of an exodus, and it's within 30 years of when the Bible said it was. That's something that you can't just discredit. Now, so then that takes us to the next thing. Why Why is the Bible off? Well, there's a few things. First off, remember what I said about we're not totally sure about some of the pharaohs. That's absolutely true. There are some pharaohs that could be moved a, a couple years, not 400 years like David Roll says, but could be moved. Or if we mis misdated his death, for instance, the pharaoh that we that I'm saying died in 1479, it's possible that he died 10 years later. So if that's the situation, well, that would so that would solve some of our some of our dating right there. So then also there's the issue of well, I'll stop it there. Um, so then that takes us to the issue that Kenneth Kitchen brought up about why are dates mentioned of places that did not exist? Ramesses, for instance, was built in the 1200s BC, not the 1400s BC. So how could they possibly have been at a city called Pi Ramesses if it did not actually exist? Well, <laughs> that's actually an easier problem to resolve than I feel like people make it into. An editor could have come by and updated the names. Well, no, that – well, hold on. When Abraham came out of the city of Ur, it was not known as Ur of the Chaldees. When Moses wrote the book of Genesis, it was still not known as Ur of the Chaldees. It was not known as Ur of the Chaldees until I want to say 800 BC or 900 BC, somewhere around there. I, I forget exactly where, but point being, after Moses. So we already know that an editor added – of the Chaldees, there's another problem. The The Bible says very clearly that Moses was the most humble man. Well, hold on. I thought Moses wrote this book. So you're saying that he's acknowledging his own humility? That sounds pretty prideful to me. So I'm assuming that a later editor came in and said, by the way, just to kind of give you a little bit of a backdrop of the story, you didn't know him like I did. He was a really humble guy, and this was the situation that happened. Well, now it adds a whole new level of depth to it. See what I mean? And there's nothing that says that an editor couldn't have done that. And if an editor did update the names, that doesn't mean that the Bible isn't inspired by God. It just means that they updated some of the names. So the question that we have, should then ask is, was there a city where Ramesses later was in the 1200s in that same area? Now, see, that's a much better question. Now, I'll get to that in just a minute. So let's look at some of the lack of proof that people say. The first thing that um, – well, I, I already mentioned this, this quote, but it's worth mentioning again. The absence of proof is not the proof of absence. Not being able to find something that history says is there doesn't mean that it did not happen. Archaeology has a lot of holes in it. I don't know if people just don't realize that or not, but archaeology is not an exact science. There's just a lot of things we don't know, a lot of things we never recover.
And James Hoffmeyer brought this up. It's an excellent point, well worth repeating over and over again. There were no papyrus documents that survived from northern Egypt. Israel was in northern Egypt. It shouldn't surprise us that there's no papyrus and from northern Egypt that says, hey, by the way, Israel was here. Like, that just shouldn't surprise us too much. It, 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 that just uh, – some, sometimes people who don't know history say, oh, it, the Exodus couldn't have happened because this didn't exist. And it's like, yeah, because that's not <clears> – <throat> then there's another problem. We don't know the exact location of where they cro crossed the Red Sea. So how can we possibly say for absolute certain that there is no proof of uh, Pharaoh's army being drowned if we don't know where they were drowned at? You're seeing this like that, that's just – so we don't know where it is, but we haven't found any proof in the place that we don't know where it is, so therefore it didn't happen. What? And then plus, wouldn't a lot of that stuff disintegrate and then also – That's worth mentioning. Because water is constantly moving. So that's a possibility too. The, there's a lot of possibilities, bud. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know if there if there have been massive hur, uh, hurricanes, uh, earthquakes, um uh, tsunamis. I don't know the history of there, and it's worth worth mentioning. Do we know the history of, of whether there were, there were those events? Um, but then there's another issue. What are the chances that after the army was flooded and drowned, that they just left all the chariots in the water? Right. The bodies. Wouldn't they have gone back to salvage at least the chariots? Mm -hmm. I would have if it cost if I lost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in chariots, but I mean, people in America don't really think about that because we're kind of a wasteful culture. But back then they weren't as wasteful as we are now. You know, I feel like that's worth at least thinking about. And then there's another really big issue. This is another thing that people have. There's no evidence of of this this big all these all these uh, plagues and all this stuff. Egypt never once recorded a defeat. That would completely ruin their image. Ancient cultures didn't do that. They, their historical documents weren't to record all history that they ha that happened. It was to brag and to show about how they were gods, and they had an agenda and a propaganda to why they were writing history. Why would they say, by the way, this god that we don't worship because we don't think that he's real saved our, our lowly slaves – who we despise because they're not Egyptian, they're lower than us, and put our gods to shame because we, could, we couldn't beat him or his people, and then left in triumph. And then when we tried to go back and steal them again, we drowned. Do you think you're going to find that document? Do you honestly believe that you're going to find it? And see, a lot of people say, well, there's no evidence Egypt doesn't record anything. Why would they have a brag wall of their defeat? That just doesn't make sense. There's a lot of a lot of things that people say. Oh, there's no there's no there's no proof, and it's like, well, that proof wouldn't exist anyways, regardless of the situation. Then there's the issue of okay, what about their trip to Mount Sinai? Last last week we watched a video where they were showing about all the different places Mount Sinai could hypothetically be, right? Remember that there were like seven different locations. Now along that, there's a lot of places out in the desert. Now here we don't know. well we know it a little bit here and in Arizona we know it a little bit but in the Middle East dust storm brings you to a whole new level of dust storm anything that we've ever experienced in Arizona and New Mexico is small small fry small fry I mean they they've got some massively bad dust storms there really bad dust storms so let let's look at this we have nomads nomads historically don't leave a whole lot of trace we know that these nomads had a little bit of a trace to leave. They had some earrings that they took and some pots and some stuff like that. But that let, – let's let's just go with this and think about it logically. They have a pot. They drop it. It breaks. You think, eh, oh, well, we're in the middle of nowhere. How would we possibly know where that pot fell right. to find the broken pot? They're nomads. That means they're traveling around. Okay, now let's add history to this. Now you have dust storms, then you have it gradually sinking lower and lower in the middle of the desert. Like, things, sometimes people just say the stupidest things to try and disprove the Bible when it's like if you just stop and think about it. There are some things that we have satellite imaging. Satellite imaging. We know where to dig. 
and we still can't find the thing, and then some things that we accidentally stumble on something, and that's when we're digging in the right place. So you want us to go out there with, with what, a spade into the dust and go excavate every piece of the Sinai Peninsula? What? That just doesn't make sense. Once again, that, that, these these lack of proofs shouldn't really discourage you that much. Even if they did, um, even if they did leave much of a trace, how would we know where to look with dust storms? That's absolutely just stupid. So that brings us to a very interesting question. People who say there's no proof of the Exodus, it begs this very very important question, and I hope you guys grasp. What proof are we looking for? Well, there should be this, there should be this. I just went through the most quoted things of what proof we should find and why it's completely ridiculous to expect any of those proofs. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to the next question. What proof should we expect? Well, that's the proof that we're going to look at next week. I'm going to look at general proofs that say it could have happened and then specific proof the only time in Egyptian history when we have all the right pieces fitting into the right thing. So we'll look at that next week, but uh, just a few more things. I've, obviously, I've already talked to you guys about how history is fragmentary. We don't have complete history of, knowledge, uh, of ancient history. That's just absolutely. And mysteries, oh my goodness, there are so many mysteries that we have no way of knowing. So many mysteries. Um, we're not even sure of how many years the Pharaoh of the Exodus lived, literally. We have, oh, well, we have one that says his second or third renal year. And then we have another one that maybe has his 18th year on it. Maybe, but we're not positive about that. So it's like, what? So this this pharaoh that we're saying for sure he died in 1479, maybe he died in 1479. Maybe before, maybe afterwards. Who knows? Then there's always the, always the problem that we could just have the wrong name on, a, on something. Like, whoops. It wouldn't be the first time that we misread something. Okay, so then a, a little bit of brief history here real quick. Um... Uh, in his in Egypt, uh, the, the period from 1800 to 1570 was a call a time called the Second Intermediate Period. So basically, Egypt was not a unified nation. That's 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 what that basically means. They were having uh, just kind of chaos, civil war, weak that kind of stuff. Okay, that that that's a whole big span of time right there. It ended when uh, Pharaoh, I believe, it was almost the first. Uh, conquered Avaris in 1550, reuniting all of Egypt once again. But we'll, we'll look at that next week. Um, Joseph, according to my timeline, was in power in the 13th dynasty. Now, here's two very important facts that I want you to pay attention to. Fact number one. These are not opinions. These are facts. We have proof that there were horses and chariots in the 13th dynasty. Fact. We know that the Bible says that Joseph had one of these. Those are facts. Okay, we know that before the 13th dynasty, there is no proof of horses or chariots. That's something worth mentioning. Then there's a second fact. In the 13th dynasty, it was very common to have foreigners in power. That's one of the big things that people say. How could Joseph have possibly ridden, ro ro rose uh, you know, in power because Egyptians hated non-Egyptians. Yes, that's absolutely true. They did look down on them. But in the 13th dynasty, we have numerous exa examples of foreigners rising in power. So saying that Joseph was in this time frame, which, by the way, I found that out after I did the dating, is not that big of a leap. And it fits. Now, then there were these people called the Huxos. I believe they came in sometime around the 1600s, I want to say. I'm not positive about that. Don't quote me on that. They Most people think that they gradually came into Egypt from, I want to say it's Turkey or something like that. Once again, don't quote me on that. But they moved down and they slowly just migrated in. Um, this would be about the same time as uh, Joseph and his father and his brothers were migrating in. So once again, we have even more proof of Semitic peoples coming into Egypt at that exact time period. Joseph and his family were not the only ones, and if you read in Genesis, it clearly tells us that there were other people coming in too. It says that there was so, the famine was so severe that people were coming from all over. It clearly says that. Well, now we have a historical basis that says people were coming from all over to Egypt. Oh, well, why does that surprise us? So, okay, they, they were moving in. Eventually, they ended up seizing power. We don't know exactly what this looks like because – 
the Egyptians, are, I believe, are the only account we have of the Hyksos. But obviously, they talk to, talk about them in kind of a trying to put them down because they're their enemies. <laughs> they're not going to try and make look, make them look good. Um, okay, so sometime in there, the Hyksos seized power in northern Egypt. This was where e Israel was. Okay, up by the Mediterranean Sea. That's where in Genesis he says you can have the land of Goshen. The land of Goshen is northern Israel. The Hyksos took control in northern Israel. Now I'll show you a map here that shows you uh, if I can get it over here. Okay, hold on. It's thinking about it. Oh, man, it's thinking. Oh, there it is. Okay. So here's the Mediterranean Sea up here. Here's the Sinai Peninsula. So like Mount Sinai is probably down here somewhere. Here's the Red Sea. Uh, over here is Israel or ancient Canaan. Uh, then the Midian Midianites were over here. This is the Nile up here where it flows into the, into the Mediterranean Sea. Remember, the Nile flows up, not down. Remember that. Uh, anyways, uh, so this is where the Nile is here, uh, this green thing here, and this is uh, this is Egypt. Now, uh, I want to say Libya is over here, I want to say, and Cush is down here. Yeah, Kingdom of Cush, okay. So, uh, Hyksos, they took over all of this. You can see northern Egypt. And this is the fragment that was left, Dynasty 16. Not really important to remember anything about Dynasty 16, because it's Dynasty 17 that comes into play, but we'll look at that next week. Not this week, so don't even worry about it. Um, but it says in Exodus that there was a new pharaoh who didn't know about Joseph that came to power. Now, the Hyksos came to Egypt after the 13th dynasty, after Joseph was there. That's when they came in. It's very possible that the Hyksos pharaoh is the pharaoh that didn't know about Joseph. Um, if it wasn't Hux, if he wasn't Hyksos, it's very possible that, um, well, no, that's not really possible. That's pretty much our only option of who was the pharaoh. Um, there, there's a few other small theories, like for instance, maybe somehow when the Hyksos took over, they moved down south with the with the with the pharaohs or something like that, and uh, so then eventually the new dynasty, Dynasty 16 that we just looked at. That they had a pharaoh, and it, it, that that's not overly likely. I don't think so, especially because of where Exodus says that they were doing the slave labor. So, but we'll, we'll come back to that next week. Don't worry about that too much. Um, <clears throat> so, the Uxos seized power in northern Egypt. A new pharaoh who didn't know about Joseph. That totally fits in there. So then that takes us to the issue that I brought up earlier about Ramesses. Was there a city in, at Ramesses before? Yes, there was a city called Avaris before Ramesses, and this was there exactly um, during the time of the of the Exodus. So there was a city up there, okay? Now, we shouldn't assume that, the, well, I'll get to that later, but we shouldn't assume that the Pharaoh was, um, that the miracles were done for in Exodus, the plagues, the, the, the plagues of Egypt. We shouldn't assume that that was a Hyksos Pharaoh, but we'll talk about that next week. And so then afterwards in the Bible, in Psalms, for instance, it says that the miracle that the that the plagues happened in the fields of Zoan. So here we have three names connected to the same place. Zoan, Ramesses, and Avaris. Now Avaris is never mentioned in the Bible, but once again that should never that should not concern us, because if an editor updated the name so that we would know where the crap he was talking about, because Avaris didn't exist after like twelve hundred, for instance. Well, I think it was destroyed in the 1500s. But it doesn't matter. Uh, then that would explain that. So any questions about that? No? If you do have questions, remember that we'll I'll probably be looking at it next week. So just write it down, and then when we get through the Exodus, if I don't. But Have they, have they, have they found any proof that there's been a pharaoh that was on Hyksos? Uh, Hyksos pharaoh? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there were a whole bunch of them in northern Egypt. Oh, really? So there were, in fact, uh, for a good deal, there were two different warring warring uh, kingdoms. There was a Hyksos and then the Theban, but we'll get to that next week, though. Oh. I'll explain more about that. I just wanted to briefly introduce the idea um, as we get ready to go into it next week. So, because this, I realized we were all either going to be here all night talking about this, or I was just going to give a little introduction, and then next week we'll look at it more and that kind of stuff. So, 
good question, though. I, we will look at that next week. Any other questions? We're good? Okay. Awesome.